translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada ki! Okay, so this is chapter 2, Bhagavad Gita, text number 3. Osana Prita, do not yield to this degrading impotence, it does not become you. Give up such petty weakness of heart and arise, O chastiser of the enemy. You can all repeat, Osana Prita, do not yield. Not to this degrading impotence, to this it does not become you. It does not become you. Give up such petty weakness, Give up such petty weakness. Of, heart. of heart and arise. O chastiser of the enemy. Are we going to have translation tonight? Tamil translation or not? Not necessary? Okay. 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 Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Arjuna was addressed as the son of Prita, who happened to be the sister of Krishna's father Vasudev. Therefore Arjuna had a blood relationship with Krishna. If the son of a Kshatriya declines to fight, he is a Kshatriya in name only. And if the son of a Brahmana acts impiously, he is a Brahmana in name only. Such Kshatriyas and Brahmanas are unworthy sons of their fathers. Therefore, Krishna did not want Arjuna to become an unworthy son of a Kshatriya. Arjuna was the most intimate friend of Krishna, and Krishna was directly guiding him on the chariot. But in spite of all these credits, if Arjuna abandoned the battle, he would be committing an infamous act. Therefore Krishna said that such an attitude in Arjuna did not fit his personality. Arjuna might argue that he would give up the battle on the grounds of his magnanimous attitude. For for the, for the most respectable Bhishma and his relatives. But Krishna considered that sort of magnanimity mere weakness of heart. Such false magnanimity was not approved by any authority. Therefore such magnanimity or so-called non-violence should be given up by persons like Arjuna under the direct guidance of Krishna. Oma jnana timarandasya jnananjana shalakaya chaksurun militanyena tasmai shri gurave namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yatapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamstya Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvayatam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamstya he Krishna Karana Sindhu Tinabandu Jagatpate 
Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Brinda Vineshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaye Vacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're reading from the beginning, it's the third verse of the second chapter. Lord Krishna had brought Arjuna into the middle of the battlefield. And Arjuna had become overwhelmed by this situation. Not surprising, really, considering the circumstances that Arjuna came into the battlefield and he saw not only his uh, cousins, the sons of Dhritarashtra, but he saw also his beloved grandfather, Bhishma, and he saw also his most respected teacher, Drona. So Arjuna had deep relationships with these two people and coming into the battlefield and seeing all this and knowing that if the battle is going to begin a lot of people are going to die, there's going to be a lot of violence. Arjuna was thinking, is it right? You know it's it's one of these family situations, family feuds, you know, family, you know, it's very difficult for families to get along with each other. Material world is like that. There's always conflicts between the families. There's so much envy and jealousy. One family's got something more than the other family. There's so much bad feelings, bitterness between each other. So this was the situation with Arjuna, the Pandavas and the sons of Dhritarashtra led by Duryodhana. A lot of politics had gone on, a lot of intrigue, nasty dealing between each other. The sons of Dhritarashtra had tried many ways to kill the Pandavas, but they hadn't been successful. So it's like the last resort. The Pandavas wanted a, a kingdom, they w needed to rule something to keep their caste as Kshatriyas, and Dhritarashtra's sons didn't want to give anything, nothing. We're told not even enough land to go through the eye of a needle were they going to give. So Pandavas have no alternative but to go to war because they're, they're Kshatriyas. But coming into the battlefield, Arjuna, because he's a, a saintly person, he's not just an ordinary Kshatriya, but he's a, he's, a, he's a very great Kshatriya and he's a great devotee as well. He's a very intimate friend of Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna is with him on the battlefield driving his chariot. And so Arjuna reveals his mind to Krishna. Arjuna was accustomed to having these kind of dealings with Krishna. They were the same age and they were relatives. As Prabhupada describes in the purport, uh, Arjuna's mother was the sister 
of Krishna's father, Vasudeva. So they were related to each other and they were the same age and they had similar characteristics. They were both very intelligent. Of course, Krishna is the Supreme Lord, he's the most intelligent. But Krishna and Arjuna together would regularly discuss scriptures and they would discuss the lives of the great saints in the past. And they were very close friends. And then when they came into the battlefield, then Arjuna was revealing his thinking to Krishna. And he had his different reasons, you know, he was worried about this fighting. Is it right? You know, before we make a decision to do something, a thoughtful person will consider, is this right? Is what I'm doing, is it really right, the right thing? All right. We should always think like that. We shouldn't be impulsive. We shouldn't be just controlled by the mode of passion that we go ahead and do whatever we think we should do without thinking about it. We should think very carefully, As particularly in this kind of situation where a lot of people's lives are endangered. People are going to lose their life and your own life is also at stake. And so naturally you will think a lot about it. Before, war, before a war would take place, if you read books like, you know, there was one, there was one famous author in America, Ernest Hemingway, and he wrote books about war just before the war would begin. This, he was involved somewhere, in, I think, in the Spanish Civil War and like that. So before a war, then people think about life. They think about what's going to happen if I die? What will happen to me? Where will I go? What will become of me? And so people become more thoughtful, more philosophical when their life is in danger, when our life is threatened. Then we think closely about life and have I fulfilled my mission in life? Where am I going to go? My future? from here. It's the duty of human beings to think like this, to be thoughtful, to think about the future. Just like just now, in the world, everywhere, there's this threat of this virus. So it's a life-threatening thing. It can be fatal. Many people have died. So. We also, everyone naturally will wonder about their own life. Our own lives are at risk. So similarly, Arjuna was on the battlefield there at Kurukshetra 5,000 years ago, and he was considering, is what he's about to do, he's going to incite, he's going to lead the army, he's going to go out there in the battle, is it right? Is what he's is he what what he's going to do is it the right thing. So Arjuna had his reasons. He was thinking actually there's reasons which doesn't seem to be right. Because he was worried. First of all, he's worried that I'm going to kill. I'm going to do harm to others. It's not good. Life is sacred. Right? We want to protect life, we don't want to kill. Therefore, you know, it's, we, we have a philosophy of non-violence. We support him, ahimsa, that to be non-violent is a good quality. Of course, the teachings of the Buddha are very much based on ahimsa. And in Bhagavad Gita also Lord Krishna mentions different items of knowledge. One of them is ahimsa being non-violent. And here is Arjuna going into battle, encouraging violence, just the opposite of Ahimsa. He's going to be Himsa. So is it proper? That was one reason 
people die. Another reason is Arjuna was worried about the reactions which may come on him. Devotees, we're all conscious not to do sinful activities because we know sinful activities will bring with them sinful reactions and sinful reactions will keep us in the wheel of birth and death longer. They'll take us again into different species, another body in the material world. So devotees very careful to avoid sinful reactions. We want to get rid of sinful reactions. We don't want to create more sinful reactions. So Arjuna is worried about that. He was also worried about how he could enjoy the kingdom. How could he enjoy it? Nobody's there. So many people will die. When we enjoy something, we can show it off to others. You know, if you, if you get a new car or a new home, you like to invite others, come and see it. You know, we, we like to impress others. But Arjuna knew that if he fought the battle, people, people are going to die. He won't be able to enjoy the kingdom. After the war, he will be thinking, so many people died just so I could enjoy the kingdom. And we see like that, described in Srimad Bhagavatam, after the battle of Kurukshetra, Maharaj Yudhisthira was in intense grief. And even Lord Krishna himself was not able to pacify the mind of Maharaj Yudhisthira. And it was only by bringing Maharaj Yudhisthira to Grandfather Bhishma and Grandfather Bhishma then speaking knowledge, transcendental knowledge to Maharaj Yudhisthira for many days, for many, many days until he left the world, he, Grandfather Bhishma was able to pacify the mind of Maharaj Yudhisthira. So Arjuna, is, he has these different doubts. He's also worried about the, the progeny that he will be the cause, there will be the cause of unwanted progeny because if they fight the battle then uh, the leaders of the family, the, the different heads of the family, they may die in the battle and if the heads in the family die then there will be no responsible people there to encourage the religious principles. And without the heads of the family being there, then the young people will become immoral and degraded. And the women will follow them. And the women won't be protected. The women will become unchaste. And when the women become unchaste, then you get unwanted progeny or unwanted children, we say. So this is a, this this was uh, some these were the reasons why Arjuna didn't want to fight, and he presented these to Lord Krishna. But Lord Krishna did not accept. Lord Krishna was not impressed at all, <laughs> and Lord Krishna turns the whole thing another way around, and he turns on Arjuna, and he starts chastising Arjuna. Just like I just read, right, text number three, it said, uh, Arjuna calls, he says to Arjuna, uh, do not yield to this degrading impotence. <laughs> so Arjuna is a Kshatriya. Arjuna had four wives, by the way, you know, <laughs> he, he shouldn't be impotent, right? He has four wives to keep happy. They had uh, Subhadra, Draupadi, and then there was Chitrangu, Chitrangada from Manipur, and the fourth wife was Ulupi. And so like this, Arjuna's a Kshatriya. He's very powerful, he's a Maharati, very strong. And he certainly he doesn't like to hear Krishna say that he's impotent. Don't, do not yield to this degrading impotence. 
Oh, this is not very pleasant to call a Kshatriya like that, though you're impotent. A Kshatriya would get really angry. So Krishna is speaking like that. He wants to incite some anger in the mind of Arjuna. Because if Arjuna is going to fight, he has to have a little bit of anger in him. You can't go out there in the middle of the battlefield in a compassionate mood. You won't last long. They'll soon kill you. So Lord Krishna wants to put Arjuna into the right mood for taking part in this battle. Therefore, he speaks these words which are not very pleasant to a Kshatriya. Because the Kshatriya's duty is when there's a challenge, when there's an opportunity for a battle, they have to accept it. They have to take it up. Just like if they're challenged to gambling, they also cannot refuse. It's part of the, the dharma for a Kshatriya. In fact, for the Kshatriya to fight and to fire arrows into the enemy, that is glorious. That is like a, a religious ritual. That's his re religious behavior. He's acting according to his dharma. But if the Kshatriya, if he declines to fight, then it's very, it's very disgraceful, very shameful. Mm. And Prabhupada also talks how similar principles apply to a Brahmana. The duty of a Brahmana is to act piously. The Brahmana should never act impiously. His duty, his dharma is to act with piety. The Brahmana must display the Brahminical qualities. And samo damast apast socham shantir arjavam evacha jnana vijnana mastikyam brahma karma svabhava jam. Right? The Brahmana has these different qualities described in the Bhagavad Gita. And these qualities are all indicating piety, peacefulness, self control, austerity, purity, tolerance, uh, religion, knowledge, and religiosity. The, these principles. These are the principles by which a brahmana is supposed to behave. If the brahmana doesn't keep these principles, then he is not really a brahmana. He is just a brahmana in name only, without having the real qualities of the brahmana. So Prabhupada was very concerned about our movement, that the devotees should display the proper example of Brahminical culture. We should be very clean. Prabhupada was very concerned about that. Uh, cleanliness. We say cleanliness is next to godliness. Prabhupada was shocked when he went to America because he was thinking before going to America, he was thinking America is a, an advanced country, civilized Western country. But when he got there, he saw that most of the people, they had no opportunity to take a bath. They had no bathing facility. It, it was something irregular for them to bathe, to, to be able to bathe, to take a bath, to immerse the whole body or even to have a shower. Showers are a, a more recent thing, you know. In the past, when we were children, it wasn't common to see showers. But it's only like last 50 years or so become more popular that people have showers. So it makes it easier for people to take a bath, to have a shower, to at least clean themselves. But 
still the standards of cleanliness are very poor. And that's why, again, we can see why this virus is spreading everywhere. Because the standards of cleanliness are so low. The people are not trained. They, they don't have any, they don't keep hygienic principles. They go to the toilet, they don't take a bath afterwards. Prabhupada, when Prabhupada went to Russia, when he met that pro Professor Kotovsky, so Prabhupada was explaining to him about how he trained the devotees. And he said, our men are trained that they should take a, a shower after evacuating. And the professor said, oh, very good, very good for health. The professor could understand it was a very healthy principle. But of course, in Russia, it's very difficult to follow that kind of principle. Because in Russia, the winter is very severe. So in many places, many people, they have homes without having much water facility, without having even hot water, difficult. So for people to keep clean, to keep clean it's a challenge in the Kali Yuga. But for devotees, it's essential. We have to do it. We cannot compromise on that. We, we, we should be taking bath twice, at least twice. I said, the brahmacharis should bathe at least once, the grihastas should bathe twice a day, and the sannyasis should take bath three times a day. Right? And if one does not have bathing facility, then what to do? Then you have to take bath in the holy name by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. Clean, at least bathe the mind in the holy name. So cleanliness is very important. Prabhupada was a chemist and he learned the chemical formula. As a young chemistry student, he learned the basic chemical formula that a salt, a, a base plus acid will produce a salt plus water. And he gave the chemical equation, a base, sodium hydroxide plus acid, hydrochloric acid will give salt, sodium chloride plus water, H2O, right? So Prabhupada said the same way, a brahmana in contact with a dirty place, they have to clean it. They cannot leave it dirty, they must clean it. It's very important that we keep everything neat and clean. Just like here in Mayapur, the devotees have a program. Of course, with the COVID virus effect, with the uh, shutdown, uh, lockdown, uh, it's not going on so much now because there's no need. But in the past, there were regular visitors to the Ganga, to the banks of the Ganga, and so much litter would be left there. So the devotees took it on themselves that they regularly go and they gather all the garbage from the side of the Ganga and they keep the banks of the Ganga very clean. At least around Mayapur they do that. So that's important, cleanliness, keeping things neat and clean. Temple, of course, must be spotless. We have to clean the temple twice a day. And when we have marble on the floor, then we just put water and the, and the marble will gradually shine. We don't have to polish, we just have to put water and the marble itself will begin to shine. So we need to show these examples. Cleanliness is also a very important principle in the worship of the deity. Cleanliness and punctuality are the two essential principles in worshipping the deity. Therefore, those who are twice initiated, they're given the opportunity to worship the deity. They're expected to be very clean. 
before we go on the altar, we have to bathe and we have to wear freshly washed cloth. This is basic principle in deity worship. If we don't do these things, then we're not really brahmanas. We're brahman. We may have a sacred thread. We're brahmana in name only. We see in India so many people have sacred thread. Sometimes even the rickshaw walla. We I used to see in Calcutta, the men pulling the rickshaw. They also had a brahman thread around the neck. So, brahmana means to work like a brahmana and to keep the brahminical principles. So, same way Kshatriya, Arjuna is a Kshatriya. He had come there to the battlefield ready to fight and Krishna had agreed to come as his chariot driver. Why should, why should Arjuna now give up the desire to fight? He's already come there into the middle of the battlefield he cannot just suddenly change his mind. That would be very that would be considered very cowardly on his part. But Arjuna is thinking, thinking, no, it's my magnanimous nature or my compassion and out of my goodness. But nobody else is thinking like that. And Krishna also is not impressed. Krishna also is not going to swallow that. He tells Arjuna, come on Arjuna, give up this degrading impotence. It does not become you. No? Give up such petty weakness of heart. Hmm? The weakness of the heart, right? This, the heart, also you could say like the mind, because the, it's the weakness of the mind. You come, you, you do things and we have a battle with the mind. Should I do it or should I do it? The weakness of the heart. Should I do or should I not do? Making decisions. Some decisions are easier to make than others. Arjuna it was a difficult decision, but at the same time, he knows what he has to do. He has his brothers there. They have, they have their honor at stake, they have to fight. But Arjuna, because he's a devotee, he's considering the, the, the pros and the cons very carefully before making his actual decision. So he's really fortunate because he has Lord Krishna there to help him. What is our situation? when we have to make decisions. Who do we have to guide us? We're not like Arjuna. We don't have Krishna in front of us to guide us. But we do have Krishna in our heart as the super soul. So we have the feelings of the heart, but can we simply depend on the feelings of the heart? Not really. We can't really, just like Arjuna, He's, Arjuna could say, well, the feeling of his heart is that he shouldn't fight. But Krishna says, this is a weakness of the heart. Two sides. To the, you have the good side and the bad side. You have the weakness and you have the strong points also. So, what should be done in our situation? Who do we have? We don't have Krishna there in front of us to, to call us names and say, you're impotent and you're a coward and you're this and that. But we do have the scriptures. We have sadhus and we have guru. We have these things to guide us. Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. And we have to make decisions with their help. Not only the heart, because the heart can easily cheat us. We have to therefore hear from sadhu, shastra and guru to help us to understand what is the proper thing to do, which way to go. It's not easy. We know it. it's not easy at all. But 
have to make decisions. We have to decide. Arjuna's situation was especially challenging, especially difficult, but he is blessed because he has Lord Krishna with him. Of course, there are other factors in the favour of the Pandavas. One was that Krishna was there with Arjuna, and Krishna is the husband of the Goddess of Fortune, so certainly they would have the blessings of the Goddess of Fortune. Another advantage for the Pandavas was that this battle was taking place at Kurukshetra. Dharmakshetra Kurukshetra. Like Kurukshetra is a holy place and the Pandavas are known for their piety. Not that they're Brahmins but Kshatriyas are also pious. They're also good people. They give charity, they're brave, they will protect others, they're, they're compassionate. No, they're also noble people, they have good qualities. So the, the fact that the battle was taking place at Kurukshetra was to the advantage of the Pandavas. Arjuna also has Hanuman on the, cha on his, on the flag of his chariot. When the armies come onto the battlefield on their chariots, each of their chariots will be marked, will, each of the Kshatriyas will put their own flag on the chariot and that, that flag will display the, the symbol by which they are known. So Arjuna, he had Hanuman's flag on his chariot. And the idea behind that is that Hanuman was the hero in the battle of Lanka and he fought very boldly on behalf of Lord Ramachandra to defeat the demon Ravan. So in the same way Arjuna keeps Hanuman on his flag and he prays to Hanuman that just as you fought for Lord Ram, bless me that I can also fight for Lord Krishna here. So like that, some parallel situation, Hanuman at Lanka and Arjuna at Kurukshetra. And Hanuman was there on the flag of Arjuna. Arjuna is also fortunate because he has a wonderful chariot which was given to him by Agni, the fire god. And that chariot is practically indestructible. That's very important going into battle to have such a wonderful chariot which was presented by the fire god which is indestructible. It's a great advantage for Arjuna. Arjuna, uh, he, the, he, there's all, another factor in their favour came when they blew, were to blow the conch shells. The sound of the conch shells pierce the hearts of the army of Duryodhana because the conch shell is the symbol of Lord Vishnu. The conch shell is carried in one of the hands of Lord Vishnu, right? There's, a, there's a, the club and the chakra and the lotus flower and the conch shell. So that conch shell is the symbol of Lord Vishnu and Lord Vishnu is the expansion of Lord Krishna. So that blowing of the conch shell brought victory, with the sound of victory to the hearts of the Pandavas. It was very encouraging for them, but it was demoralizing for the sons of Dhritarashtra. So indications were there that Arjuna's side Arjuna's side is going to be victorious, even from the beginning, before the battle. There were indications in the favour of the Pandavas. So Arjuna, he, whether win or lose, that's not important. What's important is he has to do his duty. He has to go and do what he's supposed to do. Oh, Prabhupada sometimes gave the example about the young girl who is supposed to dance 
and she's been training to dance. And when it comes to the night of the performance, she doesn't want to dance because she has to go out on the stage in her dancing costume in the front of all the other family members. And she feels uncomfortable, she feels embarrassed. How can I dance? Everyone will look at me. <laughs> you know? But you've come to dance, you have to dance. In the same way Prabhupada prayed when he went to America, make me dance, make me dance. In other words, Prabhupada is praying that I've come here to America, well, now get me preaching, let me do what I'm supposed to do. Let me get busy and try and distribute some Krishna consciousness here in this awful fallen place. So Arjuna also, he has to do his business. He has to give up his weakness of heart. He has to get out there and get into the battle and fight. And Lord Krishna is inspiring him to do it. Okay, so we will stop, ask if there's any questions from the devotees here tonight? What is the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita? Uh, I, have, I have read all the 18th chapter, but I can't understand Bhagavad Gita. What is the real answer of Bhagavad Gita from Kwang Hen Well, the real purpose of Bhagavad Gita is to bring us to the point of surrender to Krishna, to accept Krishna as our guide and as our master and as our authority and as our, our well-wisher and our friend, our very best friend and to, be, to surrender to him and be guided by him. There are many different purposes and messages in the Bhagavad Gita but that's the conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita that we have to surrender to Krishna. Along the way, just to summarize what other messages are there in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains first of all our identity. We should understand who we are. When you read the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, you should get very clear understanding of our identity as a spiritual being then you should go on read and read the Bhagavad Gita and learn about the yoga ladder and the different, different yoga systems and how they connect to each other. From karma yoga to jnana yoga, then to meditation and then to bhakti. And then we learn that bhakti yoga is the highest of all the yoga systems. So then the middle section of the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7 to 12, describes how to practice bhakti yoga. And we learn what is what bhakti yoga, bhakti yoga is based on beginning with hearing and chanting. So Krishna explains about how to practice bhakti yoga, how to do things like worshipping him, bowing before him thinking of Him, remembering Him. We want to think of Krishna, we want to remember Krishna. First we have to practice hearing about Him and chanting His name and chanting His glories. Then we can remember Him better. And then the final section, then you get how by knowledge we can come to devotion to Krishna. So like I said, purpose of Bhagavad Gita is to surrender to Krishna or Krishna's representative. Krishna's representative means the bona fide spiritual teacher. You have to find someone who represents Lord Krishna, who teaches the message of Krishna to others and shows the example of how to serve Krishna. We have to take shelter and get instruction from such people. This is the purpose of Bhagavad Gita.
All right. Hi, Maharaj. So there is a next question uh, from Prabhu Prabhish. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. My humble obeisance to you and the rest of Vaishnava and Vaishnavis here. A question, Maharaj. Arjuna, being one of the most lifted devotee of the Lord, was also dwelling heavy, heavily in his heart to fight in the battlefield and had Krishna to chastise him to bring him to his senses. Similarly, to the, to the people in this material world go through this battle in their life every day, balancing the material and spiritual needs within. For initiated devotees, they are blessed being guided by their Diksha Guru under the mercy of the Lord. What about the un, un, uninitiated ones? How would they constantly be reminded to stick to the principles? The influence of Maya is so strong in Kali Yuga. Yes. So the uninitiated ones can be reminded by associating with the initiated ones. Because the initiated ones will help them to remember and guide them. Also, the uninitiated ones need to hear the Bhagavad Gita. They need to hear the scripture. They may not be initiated, but they still should read the Bhagavad Gita and they should learn the importance of the principles of spiritual life. This will help them. It is not just simply because one is initiated that's easy. These regulated principles are there for everyone, for all civilized people. The principles of religion, cleanliness, mercy, austerity and truthfulness should be followed by all civilized people. Prabhupada writes in the first canto how there's a need to enforce these four principles throughout the world. And just imagine how much better the world would be if we strictly followed these four principles everywhere. Just imagine how many problems would be solved and would be avoided, would not even exist if we were all following these principles. But instead what are we doing? We're killing cows. We're slaughtering so many animals every day. We're doing so many terrible things, polluting the rivers. We've ruined the land. We've built so many factories everywhere, taken away the best farming land. Now, food is becoming a serious problem. Very difficult to feed hungry people. Why? Because we've put so much emphasis on economic development, building the factories, airports, highways, and then taken away the farming land. People don't want to farm. Young people today, they don't even know how to grow vegetables. They never did any farming. And so serious problems. And then we use so many, when we do farm, we use so many chemicals, insecticides, pesticides, fertilizers and different things to try to get more yield from the land, only at the cost of the quality of the grains, the poor, the, instead the grains and the, so many other produce from the land. Have, they don't have the same protein, they don't have the same nutrition as before. We have lost so much in the name of material progress. And so people need to be reminded how to follow the religious principles. They need good association. Everyone needs good association. The, the duty of devotees of Krishna, those who are initiated, is to give association to the others. Okay? Is that all yeah, right? Maharaj, yeah? Yeah. Maharaj, Maharaj, there's one more question. Guru Maharaj, Krishna's intention to wipe out the unwanted creepers in this Mahabharata war 
Arjuna knows his cousin are against Dharma despite that he is still reluctant due to blood relationship. Can we consider this as Arjuna's compassion? So, in normal human situation, if there is, in, there is injustice among blood relationship, if we take hard decision, what will be the destination next? Does that also depends according to our consciousness to decide? Dwarkatesh Prabhu. You, can you read that last part of the question again, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. If we if take... We take if we take hard decision, what will be the destination next? Oh, if, if we take hard decision. Yes, what will be the destination next? Does that also depend according to our consciousness to decide? Well, we get the results of our actions according to how we act, if we act according to religious principles, we know there's karma and vikarma and akarma. So we have to act according to scriptures at least. We should not act on a vikarmic manner. We should not act against the principles of scriptures. We're encouraged to dedicate everything in the service of Krishna, to act as devotional service, that is akarma, no karma. So in relation to Arjuna's situation, Arjuna is encouraged to fight because Krishna wants him to do it. So he's doing it for, for Krishna's pleasure, that's the ultimate level of consciousness, when one acts simply for the pleasure of Krishna. Whatever we're doing, we do it for Krishna, right? Krishna says, yad, yad karoti yajash nasi yash jahosi didasi yad, yad tapas yas tu konti madarpanam. All that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, as well as all austerities you make for poor. Do them as an offering unto me. So whatever we're doing, whatever work we're doing, we want to do it. I got disconnected temporarily. I just came it just came back. Okay? So whatever we're doing, we do it for Krishna, we do it in, you know, for the, the pleasure of Krishna, not for our pleasure. Hare Krishna, just like, you know, when, when, when we give something, if we donate charity, we give it because it's Krishna's. We don't think, I'm giving this, we think it all belongs to Krishna, it's not mine. I'm just giving Krishna what is His. So our work also, our work we should think also, I'm doing this for Krishna, I'm Krishna's servant, he's my master, I just have to work on his behalf. So the, our, the, the weeds which grow up, yes, these weeds, they have to be all pulled out. The weeds, the things which are detrimental to devotional service. They have to be removed. Krishna doesn't want the, the, the sons of Dhritarashtra, he doesn't want them there ruling the place. He wants to see the Pandavas ruling because they, they are more pious, more godly. So also we want to represent Krishna, we want to follow the principles of religion carefully, set a nice example, show a good standard, impress people that Krishna's teachings are very wonderful. The message of Krishna is for everyone, all over the planet, all over the world, all over the universe. We are all related to Krishna and this message of Bhagavad Gita is meant for everyone. 
So, if only even a, a small number of people will take it up, Prabhupada said, just a small number, that can help so much. We have to, everything starts with a, a few people in the beginning. So we're only a few people in Krishna consciousness, we're not a lot of people. But if we work sincerely, if we work with devotion, then certainly the result can be very good. We just have to persevere, we have to be patient, we have to be enthusiastic, we have confidence. Right? Krishna says, or rather at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjay's opinion, after he heard the Bhagavad Gita, after he heard Lord Krishna speak Bhagavad Gita to Arjun, then Sanjay said, wherever there is Krishna, the master of all mystics, and Arjuna, the expert bowman, there will be victory, morality, extraordinary power, opulence. Everything is there. If Krishna is there. Just keep Krishna there. And Arjuna also comes along with Krishna. Okay, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Thank you, Arash. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki.